and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to this great decisions event on artificial intelligence and data. Today's speaker, Tom Hansen, is currently diplomat in residence at the Alworth Institute for International Affairs at the University of Minnesota, Duluth. He serves as chair of the Minnesota Committee on Foreign Relations and co-chair of the Minnesota China Business Association. Mr. Hansen holds a BA from the University of Minnesota and he has graduate degrees from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, the Institute of Advanced International Studies in Geneva and the National School of Administration in Paris. Today's program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, the Foreign Affairs Association, and Global Minnesota. We are deeply grateful to all these organizations. The 2020 Briefing Book, which gives background to all the Great Decisions talks, is available for purchase through our co-sponsoring organization, globalminnesota.org. Because of that group's generosity, we also have a number of briefing books available for checkout at the library. Before I turn the virtual podium over to Tom Hansen, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the technical aspects of this webinar. Today, we're using the Zoom webinar platform. You should see controls either at the bottom of your screen or at the top, although they may be hidden until you move the cursor or touch the screen. Although your mic is turned off for this webinar, the chat box is available for you if you need some help with technical issues. You can open the chat box by clicking on the chat balloon icon. If you do not see that chat icon in your control bar, it, it may be hidden by the ellipses, those three dots. The Q&A box is available for questions on the content of the talk. Feel free to type in your questions at any time throughout the presentation, but we'll ask our speaker to wait until the end of his remarks before he turns to answering the questions. I will read the questions for Mr. Hansen to answer. You can make use of the closed captioning option to view subtitles for this talk by clicking on the CC Live Transcript button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. This program runs for about an hour and a half, including both Mr. Hansen's presentation and the time for questions. We are recording this event for those who are not able to be present for the webinar. The recording will be made available on our website within a few days. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Tom Hansen. Thank you, Judy. I'm just gonna pull up my uh, images here. We go. Oh, well, uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here, um, to be back at the library again, kind of. Um, hopefully, we'll be meeting in person again before too long. But in the meantime, some of the technologies we'll be discussing today are allowing us to, uh, to get together uh, on Zoom uh, virtually. So today's topic, I think, is a, a quite an important one for, for many reasons. And I'm going to uh, sort of look at three aspects of artificial intelligence and big data. First of all, I'm gonna give a, a kind of a history or general introduction to artificial intelligence itself, how it's developed, including the role that Minnesota has played along the way. Um, second, I'll be talking about the social and political implications of, uh, of big data and of artificial intelligence. It has uh, tremendous implications for human privacy, uh, democracy, uh, the way our society will evolve with these new technologies. And then finally, I'll spend a little time talking about the international dimensions of this. Artificial intelligence and emerging technologies are really at the center right now of uh, what, what you might call world geopolitics. Um, and I, they are a major cause of the tensions between the US and China right now, for example. So I will uh, try to discuss those three aspects before then we, we have time for questions. So artificial intelligence, uh, I'm sure you've all 
heard to greater or lesser degrees about this. It's a, um, it's a fast emerging field, although artificial, it's, it's been with us really since the 1950s. Um, Really, AI is in a lot of things that we use. Uh, our cars today, thermostats, um, airplanes rely heavily on, on various uh, generations of AI. So it's not that it hasn't been around. It's just that it is developing now uh, to a point where a lot of issues are raised. Uh, the definition of artificial intelligence is software that can reason and increasingly that can learn. This is the big shift I'll be talking about uh, in the course of this presentation, the move towards self-learning artificial intelligence. Um, it's based on algorithms. There's an algorithm for you. And um, in a nutshell, an, an algorithm is a set of defined instructions that are orderly and finite for solving a task. In other words, uh, Web designers, scientists develop algorithms that instruct or task uh, computers to, uh, to, to, to meet certain goals. AI is a somewhat more complicated version because it's really a network of algorithms, uh, increasingly complex networks of algorithms uh, that lead to new forms of artificial intelligence. Now, there are many, many positive um, uses of AI and big data, we all know that. Uh, our healthcare is going to be transformed by this education. Um, you know, I think after the pandemic is over, a lot of the uh, online um, internet-based aspects of, of education will continue. Uh, E-commerce, we're relying on that more and more, of course. Uh, media and entertainment, uh, AI is increasingly being used in the, in the films we see. Um, one wonders almost what, what the future of real actors will be. Uh, it's get, they're getting so good now at producing um, uh, AI generated uh, actors. So um, we should never forget all the positive uses and we you know these will continue. Um, but there are other, other uh, dimensions to this that we really have to consider uh, carefully. People speak about the internet of things, the IOT, um, where increasingly uh, various aspects of our technologies now are linked together uh, in, a, in a large matrix um, using big data, very high speed computers. There are computers now uh, that can do a quintillion computations per second, which is a billion billion. Um, in other words, even though we have this mass data, data that, we're, that we're crunching, the computers can handle it. So it's in this sea of big data, of, of the Internet of Things, that artificial intelligence is evolving. Um, and it is emerging, uh, becoming ever more competent in this, in this big sea of, of data. Um, there's a lot of hype about this. Obviously, people, philosophers uh, and, and sociologists are fascinated by the implications of this. Um, in science, people now talk about the Anthropocene, that we're now in an era, you know, you had the Pleistocene and the, all the uh, sort of periods of, of history of our planet. And the idea is that since 1950, roughly, we've entered now the Anthropocene in which it is human activity that is determining uh, the planet. And um, is this hubris to give ourselves this role? I don't know, but that is what is being spoken of now. And even people going far enough to say, well, let's take a look at the evolution of life on the planet. And uh, this is one version. Um, you, you can see that developing toward DNA cells, then human evolution, the brain, and suddenly we come to a, a digital era and uh, potentially toward a bio-digital fusion. Um, as I say, the, we may be getting a bit ahead of ourselves here, but uh, this is the kind of speculation that's going on about what artificial intelligence may lead to and how it will interface with the human organism that evolved over so many thousands and millions of years uh, on this planet. There are three types of artificial intelligence and um, 
you know, the, the, the first one on the left there, artificial narrow intelligence, we, as I say, we've been living with a long time. Uh, it's basically machine learning. Uh, one area solves the problem. When you deal with Siri or Cortona or Alexa, you're dealing with uh, artificial narrow intelligence machine learning. Um, what we're heading toward now, though, is artificial general intelligence. We're not quite there yet, but it's a computer that is as smart as a human across the board. And I'll, I'll be describing in a minute how in, in some key areas, uh, computers are already smarter than we are. Um, so this is the, the new stage we're entering that is causing all the speculation about where this may be heading because the next stage, if, if it ever happens, would be artificial super intelligence, ASI, which is machine consciousness, not just intelligence, but, but a form of consciousness. Um, and uh, obviously an intellect that is much, much smarter than, than the human brain. You know, it's been quite a while now that uh, in fiction and in literature, people have speculated about this. Uh, the film Metropolis in the 1920s with Fritz Lang, uh, which is a masterpiece uh, described an artificially intelligent being, uh, the false Maria that, uh, that, that causes all kinds of mayhem in, in the metropolis. Uh, of course, we all know from 1968, Hal, uh, from 2001, A Space Odyssey, you take the, the name Hal and add a letter to each and it becomes IBM. Um, and of course, Hal did not want to be turned off. Uh, that's sort of the climactic scenes in that, in that film. In other words, it had a, a kind of a consciousness. So scientists are to some extent worried. Some are enthusiastic, but some are actually worried about where this is going. And it started already in the 50s, the beginning of the Anthropocene with the tragic Alan Turing, who predicted that once uh, machine thinking got started, uh, they'd be able to converse with each other, sharpen their woods, wits, and at some stage attempt to take control. Um, that may be a bit of hyperbole, but um, a lot of people do worry about what they call the singularity uh, and when that may occur. And of course, that is the moment at which uh, machine AI comes to a point where it is doing things that we don't understand. In other words, that makes sense that it understands and we don't. And at that point, uh, in, it, many people worry that artificial intelligence will, will slip out of our control. And some of the people who are worried include Stephen Hawking, uh, the famous scientist, Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates. Uh, these people have all warned. Um, and a fellow named uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is a, a, a thinker on AI, has predicted that the singularity may come as early as 2045. So um, the philosophical question is, what do you do when you've done such a good job at, at programming and developing AI that it begins to uh, understand things that you don't? Or, or make connections that, you, that your mind uh, doesn't. Um, there are already AI cookbooks that have come out where artificial intelligence predicts foods that can come together and they seem very counterintuitive, but in fact, it works. Uh, some very interesting recipes are coming out now through artificial intelligence, making combinations that people never would have thought of. Uh, Alan Turing uh, famously developed the Turing test, which uh, at some point would be used to identify whether you're dealing with a human or a computer. Um, and this, uh, the Turing test is being used quite a bit uh, in science now. Here's a, a kind of a humorous cartoon of, um, uh, of who starts to question who they are ultimately, whether it's the computer or the person doing the interviewing. But as I see, the Turing test is being used uh, for the AI and autonomous, autonomous driving, trying to figure out, um, you know, can, can you tell the computer from a human being? And it became the topic of a recent film. Some of you may have seen Ex Machina, which I, I, I it's it's well worth seeing, uh, in which a, an AI is developed, and uh, the main character, who is basically the founder of Google. Uh, gets one of his best employees to give this machine a Turing test and to see whether they can tell if it's, if it's artificial or not. Um, and the, the chilling moment comes when the, when the cyborg asks, what, what happens if I fail your test? In other words, 
this person does not want to be turned off, just like Hal in 2001. Now, the, the initial research on what has become AI, uh, a lot of it stems from World War II. And as I mentioned earlier, Minnesota had a major role actually in the development of, of AI. Um, during World War II, the Navy had an elite core of scientists trying to break the Japanese and German codes. And this really was getting into early AI. Now, when the war ended, it was decided to try to keep this group together. So a government slash private sector initiative developed based out of the Navy. Um, and in 1946, the Engineering Research Association was established in St. Paul, Minnesota. They had a administrative center in Arlington, but the science went on out here in the Twin Cities. Um, so 40 top scientists arrived in, in St. Paul in 1946 on, on Minnehaha Avenue in St. Paul near Midway. They set up their, uh, their scientific headquarters. Uh, it grew to over 850 scientists. The entire class of 1950 and 1951 at the University of Minnesota Engineering School, the entire class went to work for engineering research associates. And it included people like Seymour Cray and other uh, subsequently well-known scientists. And of course, computing in these early days was uh, cumbersome. Um, you know, looking back, it seems, I mean, we have a, thousands of times more power in our cell phones than what they were dealing with back then. But um, it led to many spinoffs eventually. Cray Research, Seagate, uh, there were mergers, uh, Control Data, Remington Rand, a lot of very important uh, spinoffs took place from this. This was a secret US government program ultimately and none of the scientists there could talk about it. And it was only in 1977 was it revealed that this project um, in Minnesota was actually doing top secret work for the National Security Agency. So it's a fascinating history really of, uh, of the role that was played here in, in, in Minnesota. And following upon this, the Gopher Protocol, which developed at the University of Minnesota was actually uh, at one point the most advanced uh, system heading toward what has become the internet. Um, it was designed for distributing, searching, and retrieving documents in a university setting. And, um, you know, if people had thought about it more and maybe invested in this, seen it in a broader context, it might have become what is now the World Wide Web because it was way out in front. But in fact, it stayed a, a university system. And uh, a fellow named Tim Berners Lee, then, uh, as 1989, it's not that long ago, the internet, really, the first idea of the World Wide Web came in 89. And of course, all this was based upon a, a secret US government program for, for military communications, which was then made private. So actually, the, the, the research for what has become this world of the internet was very much governmental from the beginning. So, um, so since 89, we have then the World Wide Web, which, uh, which of course we all deal with now. Now there's something called Moore's Law, looking at, at the development of this, of this technology of artificial intelligence, big data. Gordon Moore estimated uh, that the number of transistors and resistors on a chip, in other words, computing power doubles every 24 months. And that's called Moore's Law. And it's true, it has been a very rapid development um, of, of, uh, of chips and uh, computer power. Ironically though, we're at a stage now where in terms of the amount of data that all this is producing, what they call big data, which is really the main thing that we're dealing with now, it's estimated that the number of data points being generated, I guess you could say the amount of information really, but the amount of data being generated worldwide doubles every 12 hours. It doubles every 12 hours. So it's every 12 year old girl on her cell phone. Uh, it's, every, it's all of us on Facebook. It's everything worldwide that is being generated. This is all, everything we do is creating data that can be um, monitored and uh, used by these supercomputers uh, in, in, in basically computing. Uh, patterns in this data and quite frankly, growing smarter. So Moore's law has been way outstripped by what's happening in big data. 
Now it's possible to get, as I said at the outset, a little too enthusiastic about this. Uh, we have to keep our feet on the ground. And in fact, there's something called the, um, the Gartner hype cycle, Gartner rather, hype cycle. And um, basically the idea that when a technology comes out, there's a peak of inflated expectations right at the beginning, and then a trough of disillusionment, and then up a slope of enlightenment to the actual, the actual potential of what's being discussed. It's called the Gartner hype curve. And um, here, here it is applied to the technologies of 2019. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm in 2019 about uh, reaching a very high level of, of autonomous driving, um, the whole deep fake technology, what they call GAN, uh, generated, generative adversarial networks. There was a lot of hype about that. And as we know, the whole self-driving car thing has subsided. It's not as easy as we thought. It's not, It's in the downward slope right now of disillusionment. Um, electric cars, yes, self-driving uh, is under the Gartner hype cycle. So it'll probably level out uh, at some point. Now, I want to talk about the, the, the major step that's occurred just in the last decade um, in computing uh, that is leading to now a whole new era of artificial intelligence. And we need to distinguish between two kinds of computing. Um, originally, we thought in terms of IBM, uh, HAL in 2001, uh, IBM computers, which were of a traditional type programming to a task. Uh, Watson uh, is the probably the best known and most advanced uh, type of, of this computer recently. It, it's the one that beat the world champion in chess. It was programmed to play chess and it it succeeded. But uh, as of 2010, there is a, a new kid on the block, and um, which is really uh, has stirred up the whole field. This is DeepMind. Now, DeepMind technologies uh, started in September 2010 at the University College in London. Uh, it's three founders. The main one is this gentleman here. Uh, Demis Hassabis, who is uh, Greek uh, and Singaporean uh, on the two sides of his family. Uh, the other two founders of DeepMind were Mustafa Suleiman from Syria and Sean Legs from New Zealand. Interesting that all three were immigrants um, into, uh, into the UK. And um, DeepMind was purchased in 2014 by Google. And so whenever you deal with the Google search engine, uh, every time you inquire of, 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 through the Google search engine, you're dealing with DeepMind and you're making DeepMind smarter. Because DeepMind, unlike Watson, is self-learning uh, AI. <clears throat> it, is, it is programmed in a way, it, it's not programmed to a certain goal. It's programmed to assess information, learn from that and, and, and adjust or grow. Now, how has this, <clears throat> how has this computing system evolved? <clears throat> well, it's evolved by playing computer games. Uh, the founders of AI decided, okay, let's just have DeepMind play these games endlessly. And once it's mastered one, go on to one that's more complex. So it started by playing Atari games in the 1970s. In retrospect, a fairly simple kind of, of gaming. Uh, it then moved on in the 19, to the 1980s game of Doom, which it played endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. Mastered that, learning all the while. And it's currently engaged with something called StarCraft III, Legacy of the Void, <clears throat> which is a very uh, complicated, high level strategic game um, with imperfect information, very contextual. <clears throat> and so DeepMind is in the process now of, of growing stronger through this. So <clears throat> DeepMind now is the, the system we're all dealing with. I find it quite interesting that the, the founders of DeepMind, Dennis Hassabias, is spending a lot of time evaluating whether the DeepMind algorithm uh, can learn to disable its own kill switch. In other words, could it get to the point where it refuses to be turned off. So exactly what science fiction is worried about, they're thinking about concretely. 
<clears throat> so the potential for, for um, DeepMind became clear, first when it defeated the world champion in a, a game called Go, which is a very complicated game. A lot of people thought that it'd be very hard for AI to, to win in a game like that because it depends on human behavior uh, and anticipating moves. But not only did it uh, defeat the world champion, but a few years later, a system called AlphaGo Zero, first you had AlphaGo, then AlphaGo Zero, played against AlphaGo and defeated it 100 times in a row. And the reason the new system is called AlphaGo Zero is because there was zero human input in the improvements uh, that led to AlphaGo Zero beyond AlphaGo. So here you can see the learning self-learning scale of AlphaGo Zero. From, from startup, it took just 36 hours for AlphaGo Zero to reach the level of AlphaGo. Um, and then within, um, within 72 hours, it beat the old AlphaGo system. Uh, and uh, then it, it just continued then on an upward trend from there. So this is kind of a graphic illustration of how this, uh, this kind of AI now is evolving in a sense on its own and improving on its own. As I say, all the, all the interacting we do with, with DeepMind um, are, are, are going into this growth. Now, without getting too wonky about it, because it's you know, obviously very complicated technology, but just in, in very general terms, the self-learning AI is based on what they call convolutional neural networks, almost sounds like the human mind. Um, it's basically an input filter output system. Um, so, you know, so, so two functions produce a third function. Um, and so the, whether it's say it's playing a game um, in that layer one, then in, in layer two, there is, uh, there is programming and software in there that allows the computer to assess what happened in layer one and then to come out uh, almost like evolution uh, into a new, uh, a new phase, a classifier phase, they call it. <clears throat> so in a sense, it's mutation, selection, recombination, which sounds an awful, awful lot like natural selection in the, the world of biology, but this is happening among algorithms. Now, looking at it now at big data, and now we're gonna start getting into the societal aspects of all this. Uh, <clears throat> various scientists have different ways of defining the aspects of big data. The, 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 the four most <clears throat> common ones are the volume of big data. In other words, what data at rest, how much data you have, then the velocity um, as you begin streaming, then the variety of data, um, in the internet of things. And then finally, the veracity. And of course, when you get into the veracity, that's when you start talking about issues that are, are social. Um, possibilities of deception or incompleteness. Um, the kinds of triages going on that actually skew information. Um, these are the kind of issues we're worried about now with the big data companies like Facebook, uh, Twitter, and others. Um, and of course, then there are other normative ideas. How visible should this data be? What is the value of it? Um, how do you assess the value of it? All these things are up for, for consideration now as we, as a society, try to decide um, how best to deal with, with big data. So um, this is a, an interesting place. It's in Utah. This is where the US government collates big data, um, you know, this, 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 this ever increasing sea of data. Uh, this is the NSA, National Security Agency Data Center. And um, it's called the Bumble Hive. Everyone refers to it as the Bumble Hive. This is where the US government crunches all this data that's coming out. Now, it's estimated that in, by 2016, this facility was being hacked from the outside was being hacked 30 million, sorry, 300 million times per day. In other words, obviously uh, all actors around the world are trying to break into this thing. Um, uh, and so uh, 
you know, the, the, the defenses must be really something if you're being hacked 300 million times per day. I know that, uh, that our Minnesota websites uh, under uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon um, are, are hacked many, many thousands of times a day. I mean, this, this, is, this is very common, um, but this one is, must take the cake on that. So all that data is out there. Um, it's, in, it's being you know, collated by our government. Uh, it's also obviously being used by, uh, by corporations. It's, there's a value to this data. It's being bought and sold. Um, and this is where the problem starts to arise. Uh, and I think that public consciousness uh, really was awakened to this uh, new situation uh, in the run-up to the 2016 presidential election with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Now, um, how did that evolve? How, how was this data uh, misused? Well, it, you can see from this chart here, the, the first step in, in 2014, Facebook announced to its users a quiz. It invited users to find out their own personality type by taking this quiz. Now, that sounds very innocuous, innocuous, interesting to know what personality type you have. Uh, many people took it. In fact, though, this Facebook app was collecting, collecting the data of everybody who took that quiz. Um, and it also collected the public data of anybody that they were linked to through their, through their cell phones. Um, so about 300,000 people installed the app, but they collected information on 87 million people through this quiz with the full intent of monetizing it, of collecting it and selling it. Um, now, whether this quiz was a ruse from the beginning or whether they suddenly realized they were getting all this data and decided to use it, it's hard to say, but the result is the same. They bought and sold, and one of the organizations that bought it was Cambridge Analytica, which then used it uh, to profile US voters, to do psychological profiling. Um, this became a huge scandal became, when it became um, public. And um, even in terms of the legality of that, it, it was quite, quite complex um, to this day. Cambridge Analytica denies that it broke any laws. Uh, and it's true that this buying and selling information for better or worse is legal. And of course, it's this kind of thing now that is leading to so much scrutiny uh, in Congress and, and elsewhere of these big, big data companies like Facebook. But this, this sort of alerted a lot of people that, 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 that we had to pay more attention to these issues. Um, now, the Europeans are much ahead of us on this. Um, already in, in 2018, they finally adopted a, a general data protection regulation, the GDPR, um, to protect the data of individuals from the kind of thing that happened with Facebook. Now this, this is becoming kind of the gold standard. Many, many countries and even US states are looking to what the Europeans are doing and are adopting uh, parts of, of what they've undertaken. Um, some of the key provisions of this uh, general data protection regulation is the right, the right of the data subject to be forgotten. That, that is what it's called. You, you have a right to be forgotten if you want, uh, to not be intruded upon this way. Um, there's reporting requirements, um, penalties for, uh, for not following this. And US companies who deal in Europe are being required now to follow this. So in a way, as US companies adapt to this regulation uh, over in Europe, uh, they are starting to, to do things that eventually may be applied to what they do here in the US because so far the US does not require the kind of protection that, um, that you have in Europe. Um, you know, Senator Kristen Muhlenbrandt, uh, Democrat of New York, uh, has recently proposed a data protection agency for the US and more laws. Um, but right now we don't have any all encompassing data protection law like this in, in the US. Individual states, yes, but not at the, at the federal level. And here you can see about 30 countries have gone for a data protection uh, law. Most of them 
um, aligning with the GDPR. You can see Canada has done that. Um, in the upper left there, you see that the US state of California has also passed a consumer privacy law effective this year, uh, which is inspired. Um, and it, unlike the European law, the California law is focused on the buying and selling of data. Um, it is not as, as strict in the, in the right to be forgotten side of things. Uh, it's really focused on the commercial uh, aspect of, of, of misusing data, which is a little bit different. But anyway, you can see the, the, the list here of other countries that are, um, that are, 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 are looking to Europe uh, for, for, um, for inspiration. And one other big difference too is that um, in the European law, uh, it's very strict. It, it means that the individual must give specific, informed, unambiguous, and freely given consent uh, to have their data used. Um, in other words, in other words that, that, that has to, the, the, the company or the government has to receive that. The California law is more amorphous. It just requires an opt-out for consumers, but it's very easy to hide the opt-out provision in a lot of verbiage in, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to hide. And so um, many people think that we should be strengthening uh, the approach on this. Now, um, I might just say before I go on to China, um, you know, Minnesota has uh, also a, um, a set of laws in this area. And I'll just mention that briefly. In 1974, our state adopted the, the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act. And it controls how governments, how the, how the Minnesota government uses its data. Um, and it, 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 it assures the right of the public to access uh, government data. Uh, and it spells out these rights. Um, so that's on the government side, not the private side. And we also have a Minnesota Health Records Act. So medical data is also regulated in Minnesota as it is in many states. Um, and once again, the individual has rights, the right to access of these records. It has privacy protection. In fact, our Health Records Act is the most stringent in all of America. We have the most strict, um, sort of health data protection in the entire country. Because the national law on this from 1996, what they call HIPAA, um, is much more lax. Uh, there's no consent rule. Um, and so right now, and I, I assume in the next session too, there's, there's kind of building a, um, I think the Republican party is trying to uh, water down the Minnesota Health Records Act um, in the name of, helping private enterprise, I believe. I'm not sure where this is going, but there was rumbling about um, some kind of legislation to try to change uh, the Minnesota Health Records Act and make it more like um, the national law and what the rest of the country is doing. So we see the, the use of data by private companies here, but of course, China is giving the example of how this data and how AI can be used or misused by governments. Um, China is going very far. You know, they have a centralized, a centralized uh, system there. And um, in the name of creating what they call harmony, which is an ancient Chinese uh, value to have a harmonious society, in the name of harmony, they're setting up something called the social credit system, which is based on massive use of facial recognition, which is becoming quite accurate. Uh, and this is a little hard to see, but um, the government is collecting information, uh, most of it online, on everything for an individual. Your income taxes, credit cards, somehow they track filial piety, which is interesting to know how they do that, uh, how, how devoted you are to your parents, criminal record, volunteer activity, academic honesty, obviously everything you're doing online. Adherence to traffic rules is a big one because uh, you know, you've, they've, got our, they've got facial recognition cameras at every corner in China right now in, in the big cities, uh, recording a jaywalker and, and goes into the record right away. Anyway, all this goes traditional input, social and online input and 
Out of that comes a score. Everyone will be getting a social credit score probably annually by algorithm. And then the rewards and punishments follow. Um, it can affect your access to social services, your access to travel. You could lose your passport if your score is low, eligibility for government jobs, uh, access to the internet even. So there's a very subtle complex system now of rewards and punishments uh, that will follow from this. And this is, as I say, in the name of harmony. Now, of course, this is, this is a, a disturbing for, for people living in Western societies with a, a different notion of human freedom. Um, and even though you know, there, there are some, I guess, positive aspects to what they're doing because in the, in the pandemic, using this kind of, uh, this kind of technology and tracing, uh, China was able very quickly to get the, the, the COVID-19 epidemic under control. Um, using monitoring, using cell phones, uh, giving people a, a green or a red um, evaluation as to whether they were uh, a potential infectious person. Um, they're able to quickly test up to, I think in the city of Wuhan, when they had a resurgence, they, were, they, 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 uh, they tested 9 million people in, in just a few days. So I mean, it is true that they can, they can, they can do some amazing things with this degree of control, but at what price? I mean, there is obviously such a thing as too much harmony. However, there are things happening uh, in our society in the US, which uh, frankly are getting close to what the Chinese do, quite frankly. The, the difference is that it's not just the government, it's a public private uh, set of operations. The, Kind of the breakthrough book on this uh, came out a couple of years, what, I think last year. Um, it's it's a really it's an amazing book. It's it's just been heralded, won all kinds of prizes, books of the year, awards by Shoshana Zuboff, who is a professor at Harvard, and it's called "The Age of Surveillance Capitalism: The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power," and um, it really documents what is what is going on. Uh, in, um, in our society. And I'll, I'll, I wanna just give a few examples now of, um, of what she's talking about. Now, there's a technology out there called web scraping. And you can actually uh, you know, get versions of this through, through uh, Google. It, it, it allows you to kind of venture out into the internet and scrape, scrape literally scrape information. Um, and done at scale, this can harvest amazing amounts of big data. Now, and, and so this is used by governments, but also by corporations uh, increasingly. And one of the, um, I think one of the most famous examples of this right now is something called Clearview AI. Now, Clearview AI is basically a data scraping organization. Um, it was founded in 2017 um, by, by this gentleman here. He used to be a male model. Uh, he's 32 years old. So he would have been 29 or so when it, this company was founded. His name is Juan Ton Tat. He's a, a Vietnamese immigrant to Australia. He's an Australian citizen. And he founded Clearview AI. Um, which in the course of the past three years has ranged wide to, uh, to collect data um, on the internet. Uh, pretty much everything we do, as I said, is, is out there as, as data, our social media, government records, payments, very important, um, credit card information. It's estimated that Clearview has gone out uh, scraping Facebook, scraping um, high school yearbooks, photos. They claim to have 3 billion photos in their log that can be identified. Um, and so once this data is collected, it is for sale. Now, um, so pretty much anybody can avail themselves of this and companies do because uh, more than we know, we all have scores on us being, being kept on us through this kind of activity. 
Um, a book came out a few years ago by Pam Dixon, who is the executive director of the World Privacy Forum called The Scoring of America. And um, she documents how, uh, you know, in addition to the sort of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you know, where we have access to our basic credit score since the year 2000, um, you know, our, our credit score is based on actually a very small amount of information. And there are many, many alternative scores out there based on this big data web scraping. So you can have scores on, for example, are you a potential high-end customer? Well, um, your companies will, will purchase data from uh, Clearview AI and come up with, a, with, with data on who are potential big spenders. And so if one of these people walks into Macy's, just as, to use an example, um, their cell phone sets, sets off something and the salesperson sees on their screen that a high-end customer has just walked in. Um, based on this data exchange. And of course, how do they know? Well, it's what you purchase, how, what you use your credit card for. Um, and there's a big difference. If you use cash, you're not tracked. If you use your credit card, everything is public. Everything is public. So for example, there's data collected on your health habits. Um, you know, we're supposed to have a health privacy act, right? Well, in fact, a lot of information is freely out there that, that shows what your health is. If you use your credit card to buy a latte at Starbucks, that's registered. That's not healthful behavior. If you buy cigarettes, oops, that is not healthful behavior. If you do genetic um, uh, research on 23andMe, that is public. And that is really important uh, health information. Uh, that is up for sale. So, all this is going on and we, we end up with, with multiple, multiple scores being kept on us um, and being bought and sold. Now, in the case of Clearview AI, because they have such a huge repository of, of photos, of, of images, of, of, of grade school classes, of high school yearbooks, as I say, from your Facebook, um, and they've been able to triangulate many of these uh, in terms of identifying who they are, um, this data is for sale to law enforcement and to police departments all around the country. Um, it's estimated that uh, last year, I think it was, 600 US law enforcement agencies had paid um, Clearview AI to help them track, uh, track individuals through uh, facial recognition. That number has jumped from 600 to 2,400 now currently. So um, this is not exactly what China is doing, but all the components are there for what China is doing. Um, and so this is, this is something that's going on sort of unbeknownst to most of us. Uh, the European Union, once again, with their stricter um, laws, has informed Clearview AI that what they do is probably going to be illegal in the EU. That this is uh, this this is not going to be accepted uh, at the EU level. Um, so we'll see where this goes. Um, now another one that I had not known about, but apparently has been happening since 2016, Clear Channel, which has probably the most billboards around the world, uh, mainly in the U.S. They are estimated to have 500,000 billboards. As of 2016, started to install radar detectors in their billboards. And this is radar that can pick up your cell phone and find information in your cell phone. Quite frankly, every time you pass these billboards now, whether you're walking or driving, your, your data is being collated, it's being scraped. Um, and so for example, if you go by a, uh, uh, a Netflix billboard, uh, Clearview, uh, Clear Channel rather, would be in a position to tell Netflix, whether you watch something on Netflix that evening or during the, during the following week. Um, once again, this is commercial. This is for commercial use. Uh, it's being bought and sold uh, for commercial purposes. But it is uh, obviously quite intrusive uh, on our sort of daily lives. It's interesting that, the, um, that the, the film Minority Report with Tom Cruise 
uh, actually had this as part of its premise. The, you were being read and detected by ads as you walked, say, through a mall. And in fact, uh, as you walked by, an ad bubble that corresponded to your profile would appear next to you, almost in three dimensions as you walked around. And um, there are aspects to this in what's happening now. As I say, the, this, this is the commercialization of big data uh, that's going on right now. Now, I'm gonna briefly, I just maybe 10 minutes left, I'm gonna talk about um, some of the international uh, implications of, of what's going on, because as I mentioned, this is a big part of our, um, our increasing confrontation with China, for example. So back in 2017, uh, James Mattis, then Secretary of Defense, <clears throat> in announcing the new national security strategy, uh, moved us away from a focus on terrorism toward, uh, toward great power politics and the challenge from countries like China and Russia. That is now the focus. And one of the centerpieces of this challenge is in tech. Um, you've all been following how we're, we've been going after Huawei, which uh, pulled ahead in 5G technology, which we're slowly adapting here. They, they, they took a pretty, pretty strong lead in, in 5G. Um, this is the, you know, the sense that they would be getting ahead of us in technology like that was, was obviously disturbing uh, to, to Washington. Um, and we are going after a number of other uh, companies, for example, SenseTime, which is a big producer of facial recognition technology. Uh, which is used in places like Xinjiang in China, where the Uyghur people are being oppressed. So the US government has banned uh, since time, uh, as of October 2019, on human rights grounds. Um, so Huawei, ByteDance, uh, sorry, uh, since time, and ByteDance, of course, is another one, which they own something called TikTok, which uh, is wildly popular, as you probably know, among young people. Um, uh, the United States has been talking about banning TikTok for the same reason. We're, we're, we're afraid that, that TikTok is a way for China to collect big data on our citizens, which they then could use for their own purposes. Um, this is still up in the air what's going to happen with TikTok. I'm, I'm imagining a, uh, a huge demonstration of preteens in, in Washington, D.C. if they do ban TikTok, uh, because as I say, it's very, very uh, popular among young people today. Now, China um, is actually forging ahead, uh, not just on 5G, but now they're moving on to 6G. Um, they're quite frankly, way ahead of us. And they're using the same approach that they used on 5G. They're bringing together the best minds in the country from all areas, government, uh, universities, corporations, you know, kind of a full team uh, approach to work through 6G. Now, this is the way we used to do things, say, you know, in World War II or with uh, you know, engineering research uh, after World War II or in Minnesota. We would, there would be a government role, often a coordinating role, um, what you might call the national industrial strategy. Um, we don't do that anymore. And, um, but China does it in spades. And in fact, in announcing 6G, that one of the Chinese newspapers, Global Times, said that, um, that this method was clearly uh, superior to the way the US did things. And it predicted that China would forge ahead in 6G um, and would cooperate with Europe and other countries uh, while the United States uh, became increasingly isolated. Uh, and it's now that's, the United States is trying to galvanize other countries on our side against China in tech, but China has the feeling that, that it's gonna go the other way. Um, so this is, this is uh, and there's the team actually, the, 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 that's the photo of the, of the roughly 36, I think, uh, or, or more um, experts in China that will be developing 6G. As I say, this is, this is a degree of coordination that we are not capable of right now. Um, and this is happening also in quantum computing, which uh, I'm getting a little bit off topic, but it does, it does basically have to do with, with AI. Um, Quantum computing will be a huge game changer. I won't go into the science of it now, but it'll be far faster than regular computing. And the Chinese are ahead in this. This is probably the greatest mind uh, in quantum on the planet today, Zhenwei Pan, who uh, studied in Austria. And uh, with his guidance of leadership, China uh, developed the world's first quantum satellite, which went up uh, 
just a year or so ago. This was a big deal. It wasn't reported much in the US press, but this is a really big deal um, because quantum cannot be hacked. So if you develop a quantum system, you are no longer hackable and you can actually hack into other uh, systems through it. And so their satellite uh, pulled off a communication between Asia and Europe. They, they, they did a successful quantum communication um, uh, just last year. This, this is very huge and very disturbing to Washington. And so what we're doing against these Chinese tech companies should be seen uh, in this context. Now, um, the US Chief Technology Officer, and there he is next to President Trump, Michael Kratzios, we have a Chief Technology Officer, um, has been sounding the alarm on this, saying that we are falling behind China in key technologies, um, and that we need to develop a new model. He's calling for more government, and this is coming from the Trump administration, more government involvement, uh, more coordination, um, across the board and, and key senators uh, in, uh, on the intelligence community, uh, committee especially are making the same pitch. Uh, Mark Warner of Virginia, Marco Rubio of Florida saying the same thing. And uh, both of them evoke World War II as an example of a, of a challenge where we have to really as a nation respond to, to this technological uh, competition. And lo and behold in the Congress um, uh, in May, um, a bipartisan bill was introduced, um, the Endless Frontier Act, it's called, Endless Frontier Act, to increase investments uh, in critical tech and to preserve America's global leadership. And um, it is very much a government private uh, proposal. Um, it's gonna expand the National Science Foundation, rename it the National Science and Technology Foundation, a new technology directorate within it, um, and then it's going to establish 10 regional technology hubs uh, with government money to, uh, to do, get into research development and manufacturing. Now, it'd be great if one of these hubs came to the Twin Cities um, and became part of this new way of, of approaching tech. This has not been passed yet. You know, obviously, we're so distracted by the election, but it's out there as a possible new piece of legislation that I think reflects uh, the challenge that we face. So just to, to finish up, um, remembering that Gartner uh, um, height curve, you know, obviously the potential for AI is tremendous, the problems that we have to look at, but you know, it doesn't, it's not necessary that this is gonna develop as fast as some worry. In fact, the economist uh, a couple months ago had an article about how companies are actually finding it more difficult than they had anticipated uh, in integrating AI into their business model. That this is actually um, once again, a little bit of this kind of hype curve coming down a little bit. It's happening, yes, but it's not going to be as smooth as we thought. Um, so we'll see where this goes. I, you know, I, I find it fascinating as a concluding comment that, you know, we're venturing into these realms um, as a human species. Um, we're, we're thinking of ourselves as, as driving evolution almost and, and, and opening up new vistas uh, of consciousness. Um, and in the midst of all this, we're, we're struck by the most primitive form of life uh, in the coronavirus. I mean, you just see the, to my mind, there's kind of a poignant irony in this juxtaposition. Um, and I'll finish with that. And thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for a most interesting, uh, if not to say disquieting uh, talk. Um, we do have a number of questions and I'm going to mention once again, if you have a question, uh, please type it in now. Be sure to type it in the Q&A column, not the chat column. I always find a couple of questions in the chat column and it's so much easier if I can get them uh, orderly and methodically in the Q&A column. So let me go ahead. I'll start with uh, what, uh, okay, uh, first uh, remark here. Uh, this person says, essentially AI appears to be anthropocentric in, if in fact humans can create such technology and systems, why would we fear we could not undo or turn them off? In the long run, aren't humans smarter than machines? Yes. Um, now, that's a very good question, and there are there are there are scientists who who believe that that, that yes that the, the machines will never take that leap uh, into the kind of consciousness that that would be actually um, 
you know, beyond ours. They're, 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 so, I mean, with, within the scientific community, there's a very lively debate and discussion on this. And yes, we do, we do program them. Um, and in a sense, we are programming probably a lot of our own assumptions or things that we don't even think about into the programming. Um, and one of those, and this is one of the arguments for the society, scientists who are, who, are, who are concerned, is that more than we realize, we may be programming uh, into these machines um, a basic sense of self and self-preservation. In other words, that, that um, because as, as, as humans, it's intrinsic to us to want to exist, right? To continue existing. And so the worry is that, that there, there, there's latent, there are latent uh, messages in the programming that we do that would give uh, smart machines uh, that same impulse to, to, as I say, not be turned off. And, and, and of course, that, that's the, I guess that, that that's the main concern rather than, than that they become like conscious and conscious beings that at some point uh, there would be a resistance to, to control. Um, and especially if they saw, if they were taught to optimize a situation and they concluded in their networks that what they were doing was optimal, um, would they resist a suboptimal incursion by, uh, by the programmers? So, I mean, I, I, I agree with you and a lot of scientists would agree too that this is, this is unlikely to happen, but, um, but there is a, a, a very strong debate on this. And you know, the, I, I mean, the concerning thing, as I said before, with the complexity of the networks that are developing um, and, and the uh, AI is capable of seeing connections that our minds are too slow to see. There, there's a real potential that that can happen just because of the amount of data that they're crunching. Um, and so this idea of a singularity where they're not conscious, but they're doing things we don't understand, I think is the concern. But a good question. I mean, it's, it's, it's not written in the stars what's going to happen. Okay, we have several more good questions. The next one is, are there companies and organizations in the United States which are fighting stronger data protection laws? And uh, if so, why? Well, yes, there are, there are, there are companies who are, who are fighting against any regulation. I mean, this, you know, th th this is a very, very lucrative market that has developed in the buying and selling of big data. Th there was just a, um, uh, in the Financial Times uh, this morning, an article uh, about how a, a secret document from Google uh, came to light of their strategy to try to prevent legislation in Europe from uh, you know, in this whole data protection um, uh, mm -hmm. realm, the Europeans are ready to take further steps. And as you know, there's even talk in the US Congress about potentially breaking up companies like Google. And so yes, these, 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 these companies are organizing, uh, spending a lot of money to organize counter campaigns, lobbying efforts to prevent this. Um, and you know, I think part of this too is that the 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 the, the culture in Silicon Valley tends to be, and you can see why, because these are creative entrepreneurs who have just done amazing things. It tends to be quite libertarian, and mixed in with a sense of, of almost a messianic um, goal of, of 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 giving humanity. Um, you know, information and the ability to steer its own course, you know, through, through these technologies. And I, and I think people like Mark Zuckerberg have been very idealistic in what they're doing, even as they're making a lot of money on this. So, um, you know, this is not a mindset that, it, that, we, that will respond for two reasons, the profit motive and this kind of an idea of a, of a semi-libertarian freedom uh, aspect of this that, that is not going to respond well to regulation. And, and that's, the, that's the tensions we're seeing now, both in the US Congress and over in Europe. Okay, and here's a question relating to the events of almost of today. Uh, how confident do you feel that hacking will not be able to change vote totals in the upcoming election? And do you think that this happened in 2016? Um, 
Now, the, I mean, the official reports on that uh, would be that it did not happen. Um, uh, now, whether, whether there could be uh, software that is uh, sophisticated enough to do something like that, um, I've, I, I would not rule that out. I mean, I, I just from friends I have in the government and things, there's, there's, there's a kind of a sense that the, that the bad guys are, are ahead of us in many ways, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to shore up defenses against, um, against hacking of all kinds, um, but it's very, very difficult. And I mean, I, I, I'm not aware, and I, I, I don't think that votes have actually been changed. Um, I wouldn't rule out the possibility in the future. And if anything, this probably will eventually argue for old, old, old fashioned voting. Mm -hmm. Paper um, It's probably easier to change an electronic vote than it would be to even to change a mail-in vote. Mm -hmm. And certainly easier than if you actually vote in person. So I guess I, I'm guessing that this is a big enough problem that it eventually will, will bring us back to, to some old fashioned Things. I mean, there are rumors, I don't know if it's true, but that at, at, at very high levels of the US government, they, they use manual typewriters. Um, you know, hacking is, it's, it's, it's increasing uh, exponentially and AI is giving the hackers now a tremendous uh, edge. And so, um, and they're focusing in now on finance, especially, um, you know, individual accounts, um, you know, the whole, the whole possibility of cyber intrusion into our electrical grid. I mean, there's just all kinds of, of, of potential dangers through cyber that are being made worse um, by AI, by the power of AI. Um, not to mention, um, I meant, you know, this generative adversarial networks or GAN, which is also called deep fake. Um, you can produce now streaming video that cannot be detected as false. And actually this, this is a big deal in the National Security Agency uh, to try to stay ahead of this, to be able to, to, to uh, determine you know, th th that something is false and it's getting harder and harder to do. You, know, you, you can get on your computer, you can get uh, sort of simple versions of, of deep fake. People are, are doing all kinds of man manipulating their images and adding, you know, beards and everything else, but it gets it gets very sophisticated at a certain point. And I'm afraid that someday we're going to see in the midst of election campaigns, deep fake videos appear mm. uh, that people will not be able to assess of, of candidates saying crazy things or uh, you know, controversial things. And, 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 and there'll be a lag time before they can prove that it wasn't true. So yeah, th this is a problem, big problem. I think your question is, a, or your answer is a perfect segue into the next question, which begins, I don't want to sound too paranoid, but is there any sense to big data discouraging the use of cash in the pandemic in order to boost the use of credit cards and therefore to provide more accessible data to business? Yes, the short answer is yes, because you know a lot of us are not leaving our homes. Mm -hmm. Right, we're, we're not going out. To, we're not going to, to you know, to 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 purchase something with cash or with a check. Of course, checks are not accepted everywhere anymore, anyway. But no, this is this is a trend. And if you look at what China is doing now, um, and, and they have their reasons for doing this. You know, there, there's a there's a lot of there are problems with corruption, with money laundering. Obviously, um, uh, a lot of these organizations will use cash in in laundering their money, and China sees um, developing a digital currency, their own digital currency. This would not be something like Bitcoin. This would be a national currency of China that would be digital. Um, and the argument is this will, this will end corruption. This will make it impossible because you'll be able to trace every transaction uh, digitally. And therefore all these sort of havens and you know, escape routes that, that, that individuals and companies use, um, will be will will disappear but obviously this gives government or whoever even more uh, control or or, or um, monitoring over all of the all of the transactions that are going on and yes i mean i think the trend is toward digital currencies uh use of of credit cards which 
increase the amount of big data that can be harvested and scraped. So, yeah, I mean, once again, um, do we want to go back to a traditional society? Could we even? Um, that, that's 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 a question. Okay, uh, and now the questions are turning to social media. This one is: Is there another website that a person could use besides Facebook? Uh huh. Good question. Well, you know, I mean, there's there's there are other websites like LinkedIn and 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 things, but but all of them have this this data aspect. I mean, they, I mean, Facebook is on a far larger scale. And by the way, the um, the importance and the scale of these big tech companies is increasing during the pandemic, as I'm sure you've been just this week. The, they've announced the uh, the results for for Facebook and others, and they're, they're they're growing exponentially. And the number of Facebook users has grown tremendously during the the, pan, the pandemic. So um, so if anything, it's it's going the other way. Now, I actually participated recently in a uh, in a webinar organized by the government of Finland where we were discussing these issues and um, they are looking at trying to create platforms. Um, and once again, this would be however semi-governmental, it'd, it'd be like the BBC in London, right? There'd be a, a, but that would be um, reliable, that would not be collecting data, that would, that would try to vet information, make sure that it was, there was not false information, that sort of thing. Um, in other words, that, that, that you've almost got to go to a, 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 a non-free uh, market version to do this because the, the profit motive is so strong otherwise. But then again, that brings in this whole idea of government and government role and could that be misused? And so um, it, it's, it's it, yeah, it's even these mixed solutions to this uh, obviously raise other questions too. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to imagine a totally uh, unbiased uh, venue because the human nature being what it is, whoever runs it will have their own, unless you give it over to AI to, to steer. But then again, that raises the other issues. Yeah. So. yeah. And uh, specifically, this questioner wants to know, how are Facebook and Google associated with or interested in the Chinese AI efforts? Well, um, as you know, I mean, Google, uh, both of them have been restricted by, by China. I mean, China has a, a, a digital firewall, basically. They, they um, have put severe restrictions on social media um, operating in China. And so, you know, China has its own series of social media platforms that are being used. Uh, uh, I think that Google has a small presence, but um, but as I say, this this has been seen, seen as a national in, uh, issue for China, and um, mm -hmm. so things like WeChat, for example, are huge, and and that's one of the, one of the apps that's being banned by uh, that has been banned by the, the Trump administration, and basically cutting off a lot of the Chinese students here in the U.S. from from active uh, communication back home because they all use WeChat. Um, so, um, yeah, I think so. So, so yes, yeah, so those companies have already been restricted in, in China. Um, the big question for them now is how does it work in Europe? And do other countries follow what Europe does, um, uh, you know, toward them? Um, and of course, Google um, has been, in the times when it, when it was more active in China, uh, you know, there, there are instances where it, where it, where it where it bowed to Chinese pressure and took things off, or you know, restricted uh, certain kinds of content, uh, which you know became a big problem for for them. So, um, yeah, China, China is an example of of a, of a national approach to these things and, and an attempt to to keep it under a under a government umbrella. Because even the the big companies, uh, you know, Alibaba, Jack Ma, people like that, cooperate very closely with the government in China. That they're on board for this sort of team approach. Um, and I know in Washington, uh, there's a lot of worry that this Chinese way of doing things will be adopted by more and more countries. Um, okay. Um, so that's, that's the problem. 
Okay. Uh, any comments on using AI backed by big data to change and use DNA and other biological processes for government and private use and profit and social control? Oh yeah, I mean, this is, yes. And the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, AI will have tremendous uh, positive uh, impact on, on, on healthcare. I mean, you know, before too long, we're gonna have, whether it's gonna be tattoos or patches on us that will monitor a lot of our health. Uh, we'll probably someday have little things circulating in our bloodstream that, that look to monitor. Um, I mean, these are fantastic possibilities. On the DNA, um, you know, one of the, the Nobel Prize for Biology this year went to two women who uh, who have uh, developed uh, the CRISPR technology. And, and Jennifer Dudna uh, from California was one of them. Um, and you know, CRISPR is basically takes a, uh, I think it's kind of some kind of a germ DNA, um, and introduces it into the genome, and it, somehow that allows you to start deleting. Uh, or, or even altering or especially deleting uh, aspects of, of the DNA in the genome, which I mean, can be very good for um, for uh, for health. I remember Jennifer Dudna at, at one conference once declared that they were able already to remove body odor. I mean, you know, if somebody had a problem with BO, they could they, they could they could adjust <laughs> that right away. Not a problem. Um, the question then becomes, how far does this go? I mean, you, you know, you can you can perhaps cure or at least prevent from being passed on certain abnormalities or or illnesses, but it's a very short leap to actually genetically engineering human beings, um, and that's the so there's a strong code against that in the West. I know Jennifer Dudna said that she has to keep track of her graduate students and her assistants because they're all being approached by private companies secretly wow. saying, let's start collaborating now for yeah. the day when this becomes legal to make your kids smarter, make your kids stronger. Yeah. And over in China, uh, well, I think two years ago now, a scientist actually did engineer uh, twin girls mm -hmm. who, um, who, I can't remember what genetic, but they were they were immune from certain illnesses. Um, now, no, nobody knows what happened to them. I mean, um, you know, this is the Chinese government even reacted against this. But um, but no, so DNA um, DNA can already be modified through the CRISPR technology through AI in ways that um, uh, that raise the whole question of human engineering and um, and and I you know. The danger is that, that when it's available, if it is, people will just the same way some parents put their kids on Ritalin so that they'll, not because they have a problem, but they want them to, to do better on the test. Yeah. Um, there'll be a temptation to use this. Yeah. Uh, this next question, I think you addressed it to some degree in your response to the question about uh, Chinese uh, use of uh, or, or cooperative, well, uh, involvement with Google and uh, Facebook, but uh, perhaps you want to broaden it. Uh, the questioner asks, what are realistic fears of AI data use by, for example, the Chinese? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question because, you know, the U.S. government is saying, for example, in going against TikTok, they are saying, China will harvest all this data and then they can use it, you know, against US citizens. Well, the question is, you know, how? I mean, what, you know, I mean, somebody's in Peoria, Illinois, okay, they have some of their data. Okay. I mean, would the Chinese government target ads toward those people kind of in, in ways that are conducive to the Chinese government? Or if they if they ever visit China, will they have a profile and say, hey, this person might be a good spy? Let's approach them based on their profile. Um, I mean, it's a little unclear. I mean, you know, the data is being collected by many entities. And so, um, you know, would, would a foreign government really be able to put that kind of data? To, I mean, you know, if somebody rose to a position of power, say, or say was in the military in, in, in some important capacity, you could argue, okay, the Chinese will already have a data bank on that person. 
because they will have collected information from when they were like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th this could be misused. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it's, 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 it, one thing is for sure, any American who goes to China now uh, will be part of the social credit system. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, if you if you are in China, you will be picked up and monitored by all this, and, and a file will be started on you within the Chinese social credit system. Um, that's just that's just part of the deal. And once again, is it? And I know a lot of my students, younger uh, students, when are, when when you talk about this, they say, "Well, I, I assume everyone has my data." Sure, of course they do. That's not a problem. I I don't I have nothing to hide. Hmm. So what's the issue? And um, I think that. The younger generations are, are more used to swimming in this sea of data and and maybe with time this may become more accepted thing i don't know hmm. all right uh, and now a question uh, relating to uh, digital currency um even if you had a digital currency wouldn't each person have an account somewhere that would hold the value and would not that be open to hacking um Yes, yes, yeah. Now, uh, so a couple of things. Yes, you, you would imagine you would imagine that 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 in a bank, for example, you you'd have well, basically that's what we have now. I mean, I, we we have online accounts in our bank that are theoretically hackable, right? Um, the, the, the information in there is is hackable. Um, I think what the Chinese would say is that there'll be an umbrella over this whole system, a government umbrella. Um, probably a, a, to the degree that they can, a protective umbrella, so that the government, um, including including the private accounts, so that the government would be the one to be able to go in there at will and access, but that it would be better protected from outside access. I think that probably would be the argument that they would eventually make, and um, um, and you know, is is that a is that a, a viable trade off? You know the whole Bitcoin thing is being used now for scams. Um, you know there are scams coming out of Dubai, for example, where um, you'll get a phone call. It looks like it's, and this is happening to immigrants quite a bit now, especially in the last couple of years. It's a local. It's a local caller. It's it's in fact it's the St. Paul police telephone number. It's being generated in Dubai, and there are Americans in Dubai with southern accents, whatever you need, working in these scam operations who are on the other end of the phone saying, um, you know, you're, you are being now assessed uh, for your status here, or it could be a, a pensioner for some other issue. And we can handle this for you, but you have to go to a Bitcoin machine and deposit money in the Bitcoin machine, um, mm -hmm. you know, to pay your fee. Yeah. So, I mean, already this is being, and of course, once it becomes Bitcoin, it's gone, right? And yeah. I actually know a couple of people who got scammed that way. Um, so, um, yeah, the digital currency thing, and, and of course the US government worries that the, the digital currency will act, would actually be a way to, uh, to launder money. It would actually enhance the chances of laundering money. Whereas the Chi that's why the Chinese say they want a system where they have total control of it, where it's a national currency and they have total control and, and not allow, as you know, Facebook wants to develop its own digital currency uh, and that's still under consideration. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's hard to know which way that will go. Okay, um, how much hacking does the U.S. do to gather data about other governments? Um, all governments engage in hacking. There's no question about that. Um, and I, I assume that the U.S. is 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 quite good at it. Um, you know, we uh, there's new legislation I think as of last year where. Um, where uh, hacking and cyber attacks, um, rather than defend, simply defending against them, we are now authorized now to, to respond and to attack and, and to have a much more offensive um, uh, approach to, to hacking from the outside, especially by governments. Um, so, you know, we're monitoring these things. So a lot of what the hacking we do is trying to hack into hackers. Right, there's a whole there's a whole uh, part of the of the U.S. government that is that is trying to keep on top of the hackers, see what they're doing. I know the government of Australia 
has um, has has taken it a step further, and they they are authorized now that once they they hack the hackers, they can disrupt the hackers. They can actually attack them, whether in Ukraine or in uh, Malaysia or wherever they may be, or or in San Diego, wherever. Um, so it's a kind of a it's a sort of a, a computer game war going on, and um, you know the other the other aspect of it is that that uh, that cyber intrusions. Um, uh, can be quite sophisticated and are carried out by governments. And one of the most famous one was a hack of the uh, Iranian nuclear facilities a few years ago, which turned out to be, a, it was done by the US and by Israel, where we, we put a worm into their computer systems and really seriously disrupted, uh, set, that, set it back by a number of years through this, through this virus that we, that we uh, put. So, at some point, there's going to have to be a government-to-government -government regulation on this, um, almost like a nuclear arms deal, where uh, and how you how you'd ever monitor or control this is hard to know because in many cases, you really can't know who the actor was who attacks. For example, in the 2016 campaign, Fancy Bear um, did a lot of the disrupting and the, and the revealing of memos, all that kind of thing, that disrupted our election. We know it was Fancy Bear, but do we know? who Fancy Bear is. And um, a lot of computer experts say, ultimately there's no way you can know who it is. Um, and there were some um, documents that were released through WikiLeaks a year and a half ago, I guess, very, very top secret document showing that the US has that capacity to, to mimic anybody online uh, and not really be. So it's a, it's a hall of mirrors, unfortunately, yeah. ultimately. Okay, <clears throat> we're uh, running out of time. We have just a few minutes left, and I'm not sure there's a short answer to the next question, but I'll go ahead. Sure. Um, why can quantum encryption not be tapped or hacked? Well, now this is going to take us <laughs> down the slippery slope of... <laughs> you have four yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah, so I am not an expert. Okay, I, you know, obviously... I mean, quantum mechanics is something that's 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 very abstruse. But my understanding is that unlike traditional computing, which, as you know, is based on it's a binary system, it's pluses and minuses, it's ones and zeros, it's endless combinations and recombinations of a binary system. Um, quantum is not binary. There's no such thing as one or zero in a quantum system. It's in flux. And, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's an aspect of quantum that I, I will never understand. And that is once two um, entities come together in a quantum connection, which is called, it's called entanglement. Okay. And I, I've never had a scientist who can fully explain to me what the heck entanglement is. <laughs> I just, I, I'm not sure I get it. But anyway, um, once that's happened, they respond to each other. Um, at opposite ends of the universe, literally. It's, it's and I, once again, I, I don't understand it, but that's what they say. So trying to trying to harness this quantum world, th there's no there there, right? It is plus and minus at the same time. Therefore, um, when you hack into it, it, it there's nothing there. There's nothing that you can hack into. In a, in a plus minus system, in, in a binary system like our regular computing, you can do that. So this is why once this is channeled, I mean, they're estimating that the computing power could be thousands of times faster than traditional computing. Um, and once again, that the communications then will not be able to be hacked into. Um, and if, if one side is still using traditional computing and the other side quantum, the quantum incursion would be impossible to stop into a, once again, I'm just saying in words what, what apparently is, is the, so, so quantum, quantum computing is an odd, very strange, um, not yet fully tamed um, uh, science, but the Chinese have gone far enough now to actually pull off communication just in the last year or two. All right, I think we've got one minute left. I'm just gonna push through one last question because I'm sure it's in the minds of many of us. Who would you trust more than any other to control and monitor AI? China, Russia, the US, Facebook, None of the above. Boy, you know, um, I suppose at some point, I mean, as I said, there's going to have to be under international understandings about this at some point. I mean, I mean, there's an arms race going on in quantum 
and AI, uh, you know, that, that, that is very dangerous. Um, so at some point, there's, there are going to have to be international agreements uh, in, in the interest of the survival of the species, in my view, um, to and also to look at how CRISPR is used for DNA. I mean, all these things. So I guess I would I would hope that at some point there would be an international body um, that would be established to do this, and that it would include private sector, academia, government. I mean, that it would be a, a you know a solid and to the extent possible. Um, balanced and representative body that would look at some of these things. Um, that may be that may be too ambitious, but I th I think that the problems will be enough that it'll it'll head that way eventually. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, and we want to thank you so much, Tom thank Hansen. You, Judy. We have run out of time, but I would like to invite everyone to join us next week uh, when Professor Andrew Latham will speak on Red Sea security. I apologize to everyone whose question I was not able to get to because of time considerations. And I hope you come back next week and ask more questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your questions. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.